Exercise has been hailed as the gold standard for recovery, but POTS patients generally aren't reconditioned to begin with. I'll agree with that. Is exercise a means to expose our system to a hypercapnic environment, at least relatively higher CO2 than baseline, to improve chemoreceptor component? I like that thought process. And I would expand it beyond just looking at the CO2 levels. And you could think about this at writ large with whatever you're trying to solve for. So whatever the, the crux or whatever the problem is in the system, that's what you're trying to do is you're trying to create, I'm going to give you guys a word. I made a video about this this week, but it probably hasn't come out yet. I'm going to give you a word that I think is going to be useful in this community, and it's called allostasis. Allostasis, um, you, some of you might be familiar with the term homeostasis, which is like keeping your internal environment steady, right? So your pH is always pretty tightly regulated, pretty much the same if the system's working. Your oxygen levels, CO2 levels, they're all pretty much the same on the inside. Your temperature is pretty much the same, right? So we keep them in these really tight constraints. So what allostasis is, is allostasis is the body's ability to deviate from homeostasis. Because the reality is, is like at rest and everything is just cool, like you can like resting is a lovely part of life, but it's not like the active part of life. If you've got to eat, you can't just lay there and hope that the food lands in your face. So you have to be able to expend energy to be able to do things. Yes. So that is allostasis is how much capacity do I have to mobilize the energy in my body to utilize the systems to be able to push my body outside of rest. How far can I push it outside of rest effectively? So, for example, you might have like a football player, Cowboys-Eagles game night. They can rest. Their heart rate's super low. The body's relaxed. Everything is really easy. But they can also get up, sprint down the field with just a bucket of muscle on them and just create a violent hit on the other side of the field, mobilizing a ton of energy, right? And then, then they can slow down and stop and rest again on the sideline. And then that, that allostatic load pulls back down again. So that ability to have the flexibility in the system to go from rest to activity is allostasis, the ability to mobilize energy toward a demand. So when we're thinking about neuro rehab, that is what we're doing. And we're saying what we're actually measuring is the inability of a portion of this system to be able to go and meet that demand, right? So if that's something in my neck, when I, when I do something simple like turn my head and all of a sudden, whoa, I don't know where I am and it sucks a lot of energy out to try to figure out where I am. Now, something that is considered to be a pretty small input is generating a large load. It's chewing up a lot of battery to do a simple thing. And then my recovery from that is gonna be a little bit lower because I'm not very good at doing it. And so what you're trying to solve for in all these cases is reducing that allosteric load or the, the recovery time. And you're trying to be able to increase the capacity. And that is, doesn't matter if you're working on a neck, doesn't matter if you're working on reflexes around baroreceptors doesn't matter if you're trying to make it so that your eyes work normally or that your inner ear detects where you are or you understand where your arm is in space in all of those instances you're trying to take a thing that takes way too much energy and operates poorly and turn it into something that it becomes more efficient and operates well so that when it's plugged back into the rest of the machine you can do more things and that's kind of like the head and neck of it and Cameron, I really like the way you're thinking about that because that's what you're speaking to, specifically in terms of hyper and hypocapnia. And there's some evidence that supports that, but that may not be for everyone, but certain people, that is the thing. But all of the thing is figuring out what is that one, what is kind of that edge for you that we need that we need to boost up? Could you explain again how to figure out if you want to do a vestibular treatment first or neck treatment? Was this test you had turn your head in the body and keep looking straight ahead? Um, not entirely. So we're looking to see how they're involved with each other. That test, the cervical torsion tells us that, that, that movement of the head and neck impacts the way that your brain is going to shift its own blood flow into the head, but then also getting some, um, 
some structural changes with that movement as well. So it's a little more complicated. And then we want to see if there's a, pro a predominant vestibular pathology that is affecting output of the neck, or is there a pathology in the neck that it's affecting the vestibular system, or is there a problem in where that information goes in the hub of where it gets integrated, right? And is the problem there? Or do we have a combination of how these things are affected? And those tend to happen more in head injuries. Um, so in this particular case, we see the nystagmus, rather than differentiating one versus the other, we said, let's run this neck because we're, we can't get anywhere. So I kind of start from the position of in neuro rehab, I really don't like to stimulate the brain if I can't feel comfortable with the amount of oxygen and blood flow that are coming into those areas. Um, it makes me more concerned about exceeding the capacity that they have about pushing them too hard without enough ability to be able to take in that stimulus and respond to it because it doesn't have enough fuel. So I will tend to set the priority more toward can we stabilize the fuel and then be able to use that as a way to then stimulate the rest of the system. So that's kind of the way I'm thinking about it in, these case, in this particular case as well where I'm trying to do things that first augment blood flow because that gives me way more latitude to throw more things at her to stimulate her brain without feeling like I'm going to overwhelm the system and potentially cause a problem. So we start off in that pathology and then once we see we're making a little edge there, then I start trying to integrate them together because this neck and vestibular component, they are, they are one and the same, they're part of the same team. So hopefully that helps. Uh, how do you see orthostatic hypotension and internal jugular vein stenosis potentially impacting one another? Um, it's a good question. So orthostatic hypotension is where we're dropping blood pressure. Dropping blood pressure overall is going to tend to drop cerebral perfusion at a certain point. Internal jugular vein stenosis is going to basically mean that we're blocking off the drainage system of the brain. So we're the pipes that go down, you got a clog in one of those pipes. If it's C1 involvement, it usually means there's rotation in that upper joint in the neck, which can compress that internal jugular vein and decrease the, the rate of drain. Now, two things to consider, there can be collateralization where the because it's bilateral. So if you've got enough space for it, it can drain to the other side. And a lot of people can do that. You'll find that a lot we'll get, we'll get MRAs and MRVs where people will just have congenital like hypoplasia of some of these like transverse um, venous areas. So like, sorry, the some of the veins that go from side to side draining the brain, some of them will just be, they just don't have them or they don't develop correctly or whatever, but they do fine by draining just on one side. So that's kind of one part of it. Um, but yeah, those are kind of two things that, that don't go together because usually we think of that backing up flow and then creating more tension in the system. Um, so what would be interesting to know is if you've got that C1 involvement in a person, um, what is that C1 involvement in terms of not just including the jugular vein, but how you're orienting to where your head is in space and how that may impact the orthostatic hypotension. So it may be a problem that's not specifically all structural, but in, in the neurological component as well.